And are you? Okay, good. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to the AFIS uh, public lecture. Uh, great to be here and great to see all of you. So uh, a few things, uh, like just a slide about uh, AFIS. So AFIS is the um, USDA, NIFA, and NSF AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems, um, where basically our uh, vision is of a planet that it is uh, sustainable, agriculture that is sustainable, and a healthier society. And our mission is to create the tools, uh, the AI that will enable that. Uh, it's a collaboration of uh, six uh, institutes, agencies, uh, USDA, USDA and ANR, Agricultural and Natural Resources here in California, um, UC Davis, Berkeley, UIC, University of Illinois, and Cornell. And again, it's funded by NSF, and uh, we are uh, pleased to have us actually uh, the NSF uh, uh, National Program Leader uh, visiting uh, Steve Thompson. Um, so today we're having two uh, speakers. I uh, will start with um, David Vishart. Uh, Davis is, uh, David is a distinguished professor at the University of Alberta and um, the creator of the past uh, uh, couple of decades of amazing tools um, that have been used. Uh, maybe you know many of them, uh, include the GragBank, uh, FoodDB, Phenomic Explorer, as well as multi-omics tools like um, for getting different omics layers together. Uh, and with, with with that, I would like to invite David. Thanks very much, Elias. Um, not sure I've got all of the pieces here. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I I guess I've been involved with um, AFIS since the early days when Elias approached me to to join uh, the board. And we were very much looking forward to having a face-to-face -face meeting uh, when COVID hit. <laughs> so it's been sort of three years of virtual uh, connections. And so this is actually, yesterday was the first time I met Ilias in person and first time I've met most of uh, people on the board and, and with APHIS. So it's been a real treat, um, really impressive just to see what you guys have been able to do uh, in such a short time and the things that have been accomplished. Um, so I'm gonna make sure this works. Okay, super. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about applications of artificial intelligence and I thrown in machine learning uh, to agri-food informatics. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm from Canada, I'm from Alberta. Um, we're primarily beef producers in Alberta, uh, but we do grow things like you know, wheat and barley and uh, some small amount of corn, but no fruit and no lettuce, <laughs> uh, no wine industry, but um, uh, there are a number of things, I think, that uh, as a, an agricultural uh, province in Canada, that we do have uh, some alignment with, with what goes on in California and also with what go goes on in the U.S. So what is agri-food informatics? Um, and this is sort of a term that's not widely used, but I, I think it should be, it should be used. Uh, it's sometimes called agro-informatics. Anyways, it's really about information, about predictions, it's about data, and it's used to help food producers, farmers, uh, food processors, food manufacturers to work more efficiently. And, and really the concept has been around for um, you know, 230 years. Um, and this is contained in something called the Old Farmer's Almanac. I don't know, how many of you have ever heard of it? All the people with white hair and... <laughs> Um, so it's a book, um, and, and it was, you know, first published in 1792. It's published every year, uh, and it's still widely used, and there's an online version. Um, what people use it for, and gardeners and farmers do, is, is for the weather forecasts. Um, but it also has things like planting charts, and it has the lunar cycles, which actually affect a lot of things like soil moisture and tides and other things that are quite relevant. Um, there's lots of stuff on, on food, food processing, food preparation, um, and it always, for you know, 200 years, covered stuff on food and farming technology trends. So this was the first form of, of food informatics or agroinformatics. As I said, the long-term weather predictions are something that are quite, quite important for this. Um, so it, if you read about it or you'll see it posted and they'll say, you know, this winter is gonna be a warm winter and next summer is gonna be a dry summer and whatever. And those have impacts and some people believe them and some people don't. The, 
the method by which this was developed is apparently based on things like how big a muskrat house is or how <laughs> uh, what lunar cycle you're in. So some people think it's a little um, dubious, but it is still something that, that is uh, used. So what's agroinformatics or agrofood informatics today? So really, I'll call it an emerging field because instead of using a book, it's it's using big data. It's using high-end computing. It's using advances in data science like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it's designed to improve agricultural practices, enhance breeding decisions, whether it's plant or animal, increase food system efficiencies, boost food quality and safety, uh, enhance agri-food productivity, and accelerate the adoption of new technologies, whether it's robots or drones or anything else. So this is the modern view of, of agroinformatics, and that's the definition I'll be using. The result is that now that we have all of these tools is uh, we have the capacity to generate quite a bit of data. Um, we have climate and weather data that we're always collecting. And if you're a farmer or anyone who works outside, it's obviously important. And that's relevant to planting and harvesting. It's also relevant to shipping and logistics. But we collect all of that data. We also collect economic data and financial management data. And there's huge data sets on seed and breed data, whether it's for plants or cattle or livestock, feed and fertilizer, pest and pest management, soil quality, uh, food safety, the list goes on. So there's huge amounts of data. That's big data measured in terabytes or exabytes. And that is what we call or is used to feed this agro food or agro informatics machine. As Elias mentioned, um, I've been involved in building a lot of databases, but I'm not, I'm just not alone. There's many others that have created data resources, uh, such as the USDA with Food Data Central. Um, there's large data sets that have not only food composition, um, there's breed and seed and germplasm databases, uh, livestock um, and plant uh, quality trait, loci, um, genomic databases. There's market auction and commodity databases, which are really important in the farming community, There's weather and climate databases, productivity and inventory of data sets, which the government needs to collect all the time for almost every country and every farming community. Soil quality, soil inventory databases, imaging data sets, GIS and satellite. So the data sets are, are huge, um, and this is what makes it, um, I guess, appealing to data scientists and also to folks with, with um, interests in computing. There's other applications that take some of those data sets to help with um, both producers and um, uh, processors and even food manufacturers um, to, to make things a little easier. Uh, so these are examples of, of web-based apps that you can download onto your computer or your iPhone or, or, or any smartphone to help with anything from um, uh, plant uh, crops, fruits, cattle, sustainability models, um, bull selections in beef and dairy cattle and so on. Um, very colorful. Um, and usually pretty easy to use, but most of them, ones that are at least accessible to consumers, producers, people, and even the food processing industry are for things like just data collection, just data management, or just data visualization. So most of them really don't offer the predictive or interpretive op options that we really need and what we think should be offered. And this is where I think AI is important. A lot of them use pretty simple algorithms. A lot of them use relatively small databases. Um, they don't use the large collections um, of some of it open source or open access data uh, that are publicly available. Most of the ones that are out there don't use the strengths of artificial intelligence or machine learning to help mine the existing data or insist with the interpretation or help with prediction or help with analyses. And I think what APHIS is established to do and what others around the world are trying to do is to change this. And this is to start using things like artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning. Now, um, talking to a few of you, some of you are very familiar with AI, uh, others are relatively new, but um, someone who's been around a long time like myself, um, typically we think of AI as sort of an older few, uh, field. It's It's something that uh, machine learning and deep learning are considered as sub-disciplines of artificial intelligence. Regardless, all of them need lots of data. 
some people view AI as a little different than machine learning. So AI often tends to focus on expert systems, things that have defined rules or lookup tables. So AI was critical for solving the checkers and chess problems, where they just basically mapped every possible move, put them into a big database, and figured out what the winning combination would be. Um, machine learning and, and deep learning don't use expert systems. What they use is the, the amount of data that focus on what we call probabilistic computing, uh, computational statistics, and optimization, and you try and do predictions. Things like face recognition is something that AI doesn't do well, but machine learning or deep learning does. So machine learning and deep learning give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, whereas AI, you are explicitly programming. Now, people who've been around long enough, um, if they started in AI, they're probably also doing machine learning and deep learning. Um, and you can kind of track it according to this little graph here. So AI is the big thing that encompasses machine learning and deep learning. AI started in the 50s. Machine learning really got going in the 1980s. And deep learning really started to pick up at about 2010 with advances in hardware, particularly. And the work of two Canadian scientists, uh, Joshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton. Um, Hinton's in the University of Toronto, Bengio's at the University of Montreal, and they published the, the key papers that's, that launched the whole field of deep learning. Um, so that, um, I think, sort of encompasses this picture of what, what they are, how they're different from each other, but also how they're related. If you're still kind of confused, um, you can think about traditional computer programming, where you try and put an input, you have a program that takes that input and kicks out an output. With machine learning, you give it training examples. You give both the input and the answer as the output. And you put it into what's called a learner, not a program. So the learner produces a program. And so machine learning produces programs, whereas traditional programming produces output. So the analogy here is if we looked at machine learning and deep learning, you know, what is one plus one, you put it in into an adder and it would add one plus one is two. So the two is the output, the program is the adder. In machine learning, you give it all kinds of examples. What's one plus zero, one plus one, one plus two, and you give the answers. And so the learner produces a model for addition or it creates the program, which essentially is an adder. So those are the, the fundamental differences between uh, traditional programming, which I would say is side of like um, expert systems in AI versus machine learning or deep learning, which produces learners or models. So I'm going to take you through some examples of where we've been using uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning in the area of agri-food um, or agro-informatics. So the first one I wanted to look at is, is deep learning for long-term weather prediction. And then I'll talk about deep learning for image recognition, where we're looking at cattle. As I say, I'm from a cattle country. Um, and we're also going to look at machine learning for food and beverage quality, safety, and composition analysis. Um, also looking at predicting calf outcomes, um, survivability in Alberta ranches. And then I'll close off with using machine learning and text mining to automate database construction. So the reason why long-term weather forecasting, I think, is of interest to us and to farmers and to um, everyone here, arguably, is that whether it's um, you know, weather effects um, and weather events affect how you live. Uh, obviously, uh, if there's a drought or if there's a flood or if there's a frost or if it's uh, unusually hot, that can affect many things. That can affect when you plant, when you harvest, how you're going to be irrigating. Uh, if you've got cattle, it could be herd size adjustments, uh, type, feed type and feed costs, it could affect fertilizer choices and things like that. All of this, everything in farming, unless you do indoor farming, depends on the weather. Most weather forecasts, which use huge supercomputers, are only accurate to about seven days. Um, after seven days, they get really flaky. And if anyone's ever tried to you know, predict what the next weekend is going to be like, usually it's a 50-50 chance. Long-term forecasts, two weeks and longer, are just pure guesswork. Uh, six months are total guesswork. Usually they're very crude. They might say, yeah, it's going to be warmer or it's going to be colder. Um, 
And they may use fairly low resolution uh, climate models. All of those require very complex partial differential equations. Or as I said, the mystery methods that the farmer's almanac used about muskrat hut sizes. Tests on these long-term forecasts generally found that they're about 51 to 52% accurate. Um, random is 50%. So a little better than random. Um, so the question we had is, can we use big data about climate and weather? And can we use machine learning to improve the accuracy and resolution of long-term forecasts for my province, which is Alberta? So if you look around, and we were surprised, but there's huge amounts of data that's been collected on weather, weather on temperature, humidity, um, wind chill index, uh, snowfall, which you don't get here, but we get lots of in Alberta, um, uh, moisture levels. Uh, so we can go back 80, 90 years easily and get detailed data for about 50 different regions. Um, you can also get a lot of historic data about things like El Nino and La Nina. You can also track carbon dioxide levels and volcanic activity. All of those also are known to affect uh, long-term and short-term weather. So we took all that data, uh, and it was a lot, and combined it into a, a deep um, neural net. This is so deep learning. That was intended to find patterns to perform accurate medium and long-term weather prediction. So we use something called a, a long short-term memory network. So this is a, a deep neural net that tries to resemble the way our brains work. Um, it's a, a recurrent neural net. It's able to remember and it's able to forget. Um, and we have long-term memories and we have short-term memories. And so it's a little more advanced than a simple artificial neural net. And it performs better than the, the, the hidden Markov model, which is also used to do long-term predictions. Um, anyways, it's great for sequential data, which is what we have, temporal data for every month, every day, every week, uh, in terms of um, different regions for their temperature, um, moisture, humidity, rainfall, snowfall, and so on. So what we had is um, tracking from 1961 to 2022 for what's called Region 11. This is the Edmonton region, which is where our university is located. And what we did was we sort of synthetically um, stopped the data at 2021, uh, but trained on all the previous data. And then we said, okay, what's it gonna be like in terms of rainfall uh, for 2022? And what's it gonna be like for 2023? So that's the upper prediction or upper model. So uh, we did the prediction, which is orange. The, the stuff in blue is the actual data. Uh, you can see the actual data is a little noisier. Um, again, there's some smoothing that we did, but you can see that for 2022, uh, the prediction was from this LSTM, that it was gonna be a lot of moisture. It was high precipitation. So then we pulled away the, the curtain and lo and behold, in fact, we had quite a bit of precipitation. But what struck us at the time that we were running the model, uh, it wasn't, this is in 2022, uh, it said that we we're going to have a pretty bad drought in 2023. And this is just using data for up to October 2022. So that's when we made the prediction. Um, and um, we also not only did it for the Edmonton region, but we did it for a bunch of other regions across uh, Alberta. And again, did some confirmations and got, you know, different results. But again, you know, this region 32 actually had two consecutive low uh, rainfall seasons, whereas region 42 had uh, a high rainfall season in 2022. Um, so we applied it to all 42 weather districts in Alberta. And uh, months one uh, represents, I guess that would have been uh, January, February, March, April, May. So uh, June is month six, month nine is September. Um, red is drought, deep red is bad drought. Um, green is um, more moisture. So the prediction even by um, March was that things are starting to dry out um, and that uh, through uh, May and June and July, it was gonna be very dry, uh, pretty serious drought actually. Uh, some of you may have heard about the fires in Canada. Um, um, basically, most of Canada burned up this summer. Um, 
Western Canada, the West Coast, uh, Central Canada, Ontario, Quebec were all in flames. Uh, most of them uh, regions had pretty severe droughts through the summer. Um, we started to get a reprieve uh, towards uh, the end of August and September. It's actually been a wet fall. And so in fact, the prediction is also saying that our fall and early winter is gonna be fairly wet. And that seems to be the way it is. Um, so we predicted drought across Alberta. This is back in October 22 uh, across Alberta. We predicted fires across Alberta and the boreal forests, which are in the Northern part. And essentially all the predictions were accurate, uh, both in terms of the monthly and the long-term predictions. So I think there's some interesting implications here. Um, we know that long-term weather forecasts are pretty critical for both sh short and medium-term planning. So farmers, producers, packagers, shippers, and essentially all components of the food supply chain need to know what's going to happen with the weather and need to plan accordingly. Um, what we've done for Alberta could be easily applied to California. It could be applied to the Midwest, to the Northern Prairies. Um, the data exists. We just haven't bothered to create the model. But we also felt it would be something that would be really useful to apply to other things, other tools. This is an example of a predictive tool um, for things like general farm management, general ranch management. Um, but it also could be used to help with a lot of predictive applications in the agri-food industry. So now I'm going to turn from weather prediction and deep learning to using image recognition. And this is something to look at animal welfare or stress diagnosis. So I know most of you and the focus on APHIS is not on animal um, or livestock work, but as I say, in Canada, this is a big area in Alberta in particular. So if cattle are in hot areas during drought, they have stress. If they hold the cow into a um, placement area while they're being milked, they get stressed. If they're being put into short uh, confined quarters, they get stressed. But some are uh, high stressors, some are low stressors, just like some people uh, are very relaxed and others get very panicky. But stress affects things like meat quality, milk quality, and overall animal welfare. Now, you can't ask a cow, are you stressed? They won't tell you. So you have to use some other methods. And in many cases, it would be better to do it remotely, um, preferably through cameras, um, especially when you're monitoring them in barns, because um, you can't have a person or multiple people watching them all the time. So what they're doing is setting up infrared cameras, and they're just taking uh, essentially movies of cattle um, to detect uh, stress. And they're looking at uh, how much heat is radiated from their head around their eyes and how much their noses flare. And you, these are stressed cows, and you can see that their noses are flared and their mouths are open. Uh, they're panting. Um, so they expose them to different stressors so they could do it in a confined or controlled place. So they you know, gave them less food, they restricted their movement and they uh, covered their eyes just to induce stress so they could see what would happen and how they could measure it. Uh, so what we're confronted with is a whole bunch of pictures, uh, these movies, infrared movies um, with cows moving their heads, rocking around, some big cows, some little cows, some different breeds of cows. And we had to figure out, you know, where is the head? Uh, then we had to figure out um, where is the actual cow because there's, you know, pictures of, of, or at least piping and fencing and other stuff all around it. So these are not simple images. It's not as if it's a white background. Um, so we had to do things like uh, profiling and integration, bounding box definition. We had to remove background. Um, and then we had to identify the nose and the nostrils to help identify breathing rate and identify the eye region to measure heat loss. So again, to do this, it's easy for our eyes to do. It's hard for a computer to do. So the use of various uh, artificial neural nets and convolutional neural nets to do both the bounding box and the eye detection um, and to find the regions where the eyes were all had to be used. Um, and it wasn't trivial, um, but eventually we were able to get some pretty good uh, selection. So in addition to getting the eyes and measuring the total integrated area of the white regions and the light gray regions, we also had to identify the nose. Turns out the nose is also a hot area. Um, also made it more challenging because you don't see the nostrils very easily. Again, we had to use more complicated deep learning methods uh, to be able to identify the nose and then use the um, 
various edge detectors to identify the shape of the nostrils, how rapidly they were changing, because remember, these are movies. Uh, so we're capturing all this information, trying to convert it into digital data. In this case, we're tracking the noses as their uh, nostrils are opening and closing. Now, it looks pretty messy, but you can identify cows that are breathing rapidly, which says high stress, and then cows that are breathing less rapidly, uh, which suggests slow stress. So this is still in process, but it's an example of where image detection, especially with infrared or low cost infrared, uh, allows you to do something that is normally impossible or difficult to do uh, in, a, in a cattle ranch or a dairy farm. Another area which we've been working on, and this relates partly to our studies with food composition and the food database that um, um, we've been working on uh, for a number of years called FoodDB. Um, and this is the idea of trying to use uh, machine learning to help with uh, characterizing the composition of foods or beverages uh, using spectral analysis. Uh, the area that we happened to, to look at uh, most recently was alcoholic beverage testing. So alcoholic beverages are, are big industry. Wine markets, uh, half a trillion. Beer markets, almost a trillion. California wine industry is almost $100 billion a year. But in the areas of, of whether it's beer or wine, uh, quality, reproducibility, and safety uh, are critical. Um, and how a beer tastes or how a wine tastes uh, can change from season to season or year to year, uh, whether there's uh, smoke taint or other things that affect them. Now, when wine or beer are tested, typically people only measure four or five features. They usually measure alcohol content, uh, the sugars or bricks measurements, pH, uh, sulfates, and then titratable acidity. But we know from other studies that, that wine and beer have hundreds, if not thousands, of chemical components that all contribute to flavor, quality, and safety. So what we wanted to do was apply both NMR and mass spectrometry to look at these things. And this is something called metabolomics. Um, this is an example where we're using something called spectral deconvolution to figure out the composition of a complex mixture. So the blue spectrum uh, is a mixture. And if you look at the red and the green and the purple spectra and you kind of add them together, you can see that they add up to the purple spectrum. So that's convolution. But deconvolution is to take that purple spectrum and figure out that those three components, what those red, green, and purple ones are. And that's a harder problem. That's called an inverse problem. Um, the tool we developed is called MAGMET, or Magnetic Resonance for Metabolomics. And it uses a combination of machine learning and expert-based systems, AI, to perform that deconvolution and pattern finding. It has to do a variety of things like phasing, which is something if you've done NMR, you'll know about, chemical shift referencing, removing the water signal, baseline correction, peak deconvolution, compound identification, metabolite identification. So it can detect anywhere from 50 to up to 80 compounds, and it can do it in things like blood or urine. We can do it in cerebral spinal fluid, but we can also do it in milk, wine, beer, or juice. And it can all be done in about five minutes by a computer. You can do it by hand, but it would take an average person about 10 hours or a skilled person about an hour. Um, so this is a, the processing step that we have to do with NMR. Again, if you've never done NMR, it means nothing. If you have, then it tells you there's lots of steps that it has to do. And most of these things have to be done um, by an expert or by something that's done machine learning. So uh, we take a glass of wine, we pour it down the NMR. We'll actually put it in a tube first, and then we put it in the NMR. And then we collect spectra. And you can see an example of the spectrum being analyzed. You can see uh, the ethanol, which is a huge peak. You can see glycerol. You can see fructose, uh, malic acid, tartaric acid. And if you look really closely, or if you have amazing eyes, you might be able to see some of the concentrations. This is a list of uh, metabolites that we can measure by NMR, or compounds that we can measure. And this is a Sauvignon Blanc from uh, New Zealand. Uh, we have done California wines. We've also done Canadian wines and beers. Um, and you can see that, that wine is not just ethanol and something else. There's almost 100 compounds that we can measure. There's almost uh, all of the amino acids, lots of organic acids, lots of different sugars, uh, a whole range of alcohols. So it's not just ethanol. There's butanol, there's propanol, there's methanol in wine. And there's lots of other compounds, including a few vitamins. 
Um, it's remarkably complicated and we're only measuring things down to about uh, 10 migs per mil or 10 migs per liter. NMR can measure lots of volatiles and lots of faults in wine. So it can pick up obviously methanol, acetic acid, formic acid, which you don't generally want. Uh, but it can also pick up a whole bunch of other compounds that contribute to the flavor of nice white wines. Um, butane diol or ethyl acetate or ethyl lactate or uh, isoamyl alcohol or phenylethanol. These are sort of unique to Sauvignon Blanc and the amount that's there is quite proportionate to the, the characteristic quality and aroma and flavor of the wine. Now, NMR isn't particularly sensitive. So if you want something that's really sensitive, you can run to uh, liquid chromatography mass spec. And so we've been adapting the same concepts from magnet to liquid chromatography mass spec to do food and beverage analysis. So we have a bunch of assays we've developed that can measure anywhere from 250 to about 1500 compounds in various foods, beverages, and biofluids. And it's been adapted to a 96 well plate system. So you can do high throughput in about 20 minutes per sample. Um, and um, to do it and to do it quickly, uh, if you've got a 96 well plate, it means you're analyzing anywhere from um, 40,000 to 100,000 peak features. Uh, that's a lot to do manually. So we use machine learning that uh, does the peak analysis, peak shape uh, identification. Uh, and quantification. And the nice thing about this is you can get away with about one-tenth the amount of volume, just 50 microliters. That's about one drop uh, to analyze um, a food sample or a beverage sample. Now, mass spec is a little more complicated than MR, um, partly because different instruments behave very differently. So you have to make it work on different tools, different instruments. But the net result is it's much more sensitive. You can measure things down to nanomolar concentrations or sub micrograms per liter. You can detect many of the wine faults that you'd wanna look for, uh, a lot of the flavor compounds, a lot of the colorant compounds. And you can do this quite inexpensively now with these different assays that are available. So again, machine learning is critical and has been critical to moving this to generate the type of data you'd like to be able to measure for real detailed food composition. Now, the problem is that NMR and mass spec instruments are expensive. Uh, the average farmer isn't gonna have one on their farm. Uh, the average lab isn't gonna have it in their lab. Uh, but what people can do, whether it's in food production or food processing is they can get things like near infrared. Uh, systems. So these are about the size of the microphone and they can run and use your, your iPhone. And there's lots of examples where people have been using near IR and machine learning to do uh, food analysis, whether it's measuring milk fat or sugar content or egg freshness or alcohol content. Now, I think that's it's it's underusing the capabilities of near IR. And this is a comment I'd made earlier to a few of you that, that really, if you can have this capacity measure 600 compounds instead of two or three, why not adapt infrared uh, to do that? So the, the rich chemical content that you can get from NMR or GCMS or LCMS can actually serve as the training data. And if you have that rich training data, then you can use the near infrared data or mid infrared data to do the analysis. Now you're not gonna get as many features, obviously the spectra aren't as rich as they are with mass spec or, or NMR, but there's a lot that probably is extractable and learnable. So maybe instead of two compounds, you'll get 50. Uh, and so I think that's something that would give potentially a lot of food producers and manufacturers and processors sort of the handheld tools to do some pretty advanced and pretty detailed chemical analyses. Now jumping back to work in, um, cattle ranching and dairy production. Uh, we were also interested in applying machine learning to predict calf outcomes. Um, so this is a little bit like, you know, taking a, a newborn baby and predicting whether they'll become a, a, the next Bill Gates or uh, land in jail. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is what can happen with, with calf outcomes. So in cattle ranchers, both dairy and beef, would like to be able to predict which cows will live and die uh, how big they'll be, the weaning rate, which is their growth rate, uh, and the ultimate productivity 
So whether they'll produce, say, lots of milk or produce, if they're going to be cows, whether they'll have many other calves. And they want to do this as early as possible. And so that makes allows them to get, make some decisions. Um, you know, if this is a lost cause, should we bring in the vet and pay hundreds of dollars? Uh, if we've got real problems, uh, should we just cull off uh, all of the, the calves or should we keep certain ones because these are going to be very productive? As it is, most cattle ranchers, dairy producers, it's all guesswork. Um, they might use the information of the dam or the mother and say, this is a good cow, so the cows must all be good, and that's not usually the case. So can we predict whether a calf might die? Uh, again, we got lots of data from a bunch of different ranches. When we took information about whether it was a male or female, whether they're twins or singlets, um, year of birth, which is used to determine um, the temperature and humidity and wind chill at birth, um, and the birth weight and the age of the mother. Um, then we used essentially a, a decision tree, ran it, did usual training and testing, and, and instead of being 50-50, you know, lives or dies, um, we got a, an answer that was about 85% accurate. So in fact, calf mortality is predictable, um, and potentially this could be useful for, for ranchers in making some decisions. More relevant typically is weaning weight, um, which is the size of the cow or um, um, calf at the point that it, it is weaned from its mother. And it measures not only the calf's growth potential, but also the milking ability of the, the females. Um, so again, large collection of data, lots of calves, lots of years, lots of locations, largely the same data. And then in this case, we're not saying, does it live or die? We're trying to say, how big will it be and how many pounds will it weigh? And so the correlation here wasn't random. In fact, we got a correlation of about 0.7. And these are just some of the predicted weights and actual weights. And you can see the numbers and they're generally pretty close. So this too is also predictable. And likewise, the overall productivity of a cow is, is, appears also to be quite predictable. So if you have these types of predictors that can sort of take a calf at birth and say, yes, this will live or die, yes, this will grow quickly or slowly, or yes, this will be a highly productive cow, this could be very useful for ranch management, um, for dairy management and herd management. Um, and then if we could couple it to some of the things like the long-term weather predictions and various financial and marketing tools that you can also use machine learning to predict uh, trends with, um, you could start doing things like scenario building. So we've been implementing all of these tools into something called Armchair Rancher. And this is where we've worked very closely with ranchers in the community who were sort of telling us they needed something like this. And then we meet with them every two weeks to say, how is it looking? Uh, and what do you want to see? And, and this interaction I think has been really, really helpful because we're trying to address the needs of the users. And so the intent is that now if this actually gets finished later this year, um, most of the ranchers could just sit in their armchair and do most of their ranching uh, by the comfort of the fire. The last part I wanted to talk about was this idea of, of text mining. And I think those of you who've worked with um, Elias Sun and Food Atlas are very much aware of the importance of text mining. Um, and this is something that I think is, is emerging for, for many people in the field of, of both machine learning and database and data construction we're getting a lot of data um, and it's thousands of journals are being produced, hundreds of thousands of papers. I think it's like 1 million articles appear in PubMed every year. There's no way any of us could read all of them. Um, but in order to maintain and update databases uh, that are needed in the agri-food industry and agri-food informatics, you need people to read them and there just aren't enough of us. Um, same level, there's huge amounts of electronic data that are being generated. And again, people can't simply read it or grab it. Um, it's basically too much. Uh, it's too much for the curators. It's too much for the tool developers to manage. So right now, there's more focus on the use of natural language processing, named entity extraction, and the use of things like chatbots and large language models to try and mine data, to create things like knowledge graphs, and to have things like chat analytics or chatbot analytics. So here's an example of information extraction with ChatGPT. So this is some text that someone had about the uh, story of, of artificial intelligence and artificial robots and how it emerged over history. 
And so you can see the paragraph and you can read what it says. And then there's a, a request to ChatPT. Extract the data classes, get the century, the date, scientist, the paper, and put it into a JSON object. So in a second, ChatGPT produces exactly that. It tells you that the whole story was in the 20th century. It highlights the main scientist, Alan Turing, when he actually made his uh, key innovations and the paper that he published. So what happens with large language models, and if anyone's ever used ChatGPT, it really is great at named entity recognition. And it's able to extrapolate and categorize additional context and content about the information. So you can take versions of ChatGPT um, and um, get it to do some pretty impressive kinds of data extraction. So here's a sentence or actually a paragraph about something called four paradoxic acid. Um, and we wanted to extract the information about it and to put it into certain categories. And we had essentially an ontology we constructed for it. And we created these sorts of triples about X is Y and um, A is B uh, or A is from. And so the, the relation is that is either as an is a or as a product of. And these are all terms that were constructed for this particular ontology. So, you know, a 50 word sentence, um, this is only a fraction of it, but this is all the information that could be properly identified. All the chemicals were identified, all the names were identified, all the functional relations were identified and it went on and on. So what we're doing and obviously what Ilias is doing and many other people are starting to do is to take um, these tools, uh, what are called fine tuned versions of um, or in context learning versions of these large language models to do fact extraction, to create ontology triples, which then create knowledge graphs. And then once you have these knowledge graphs, you can either interface them with another chat system, a chat bot. So then you can do chat-based querying or you can do automatic database updating. And I think this is the way that the future of data construction and data building is gonna be done. And I think Elise is nodding his head. And I think this is a consensus that's happening, for particularly for people that are having to deal with just too much data. Um, and I think it opens up, I think, a wonderful new opportunity. Um, and now we can actually explore and create uh, other data resources um, and, and make the accessing of these data sets much, much easier and more intuitive. So I think the applications of AI, of machine learning and deep learning to agri-food and agroinformatics is really just beginning. Uh, you guys are right in the, the, I guess the leading edge or bleeding edge of this, this new wave. I've given you some examples of how we've been using machine learning and deep learning and how we're mostly using it for certain Alberta specific farming or food testing needs, but they can all be applied to other areas, other regions and other types of needs. I think they're very transferable to other jurisdictions, other countries, other states, and other kinds of related food and farm applications. I think it's re really boundless. And you've seen some examples already today, um, other examples I'm showing, and I think you'll see other examples that Abby will bring up. Um, the body of usable data is growing. Um, and I think the needs of the food system are becoming more compelling and, and AI, I think, will address many of those. So with that, I wanna thank uh, a lot of the people who've helped with this work and also thank you for listening. David, guys, we have a microphone that will be floating around for questions. So please just raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone up to you. Oh, perfect. Okay. One sec, test. Hi, I was curious about the absolute and relative feature importance for the weaning weight and mortality. You listed a number of features such as wind chill at birth and twinning. I was curious about those. So which ones were the most important? Yeah. So usually I think it was the age of the dam was actually the most important. Um, twinning, I think, was the most important for uh, mortality. Um, but I don't remember all of the weights for the different ones. But yeah, those are the sort of the two that popped up most. Hi, thanks, that was very fun. Um, I've heard sort of anecdotally, I don't know uh, scientifically, that that something like ChatGPT is getting less accurate over the year, um, with the hypothesis being that as it gets, as it sees more and more stuff generated by ChatGPT or other generative AIs, it, it learns those rather than learning from new data. Is there any danger of, of that type of sort of 
I don't know, it's false learning or late learning based on the model itself when you create databases that end up being mostly generated by a tool like this. Yeah, so what we're really using ChatGPT for is, is for named entity recognition and for context. And that's what it's really good at, um, even if it's spitting out hallucinatory facts or anything like that. So if you take factual literature, so we're taking the scientific literature and we're just saying, pull out the facts or pull out the entities and the relationships to each other and put this into a structured ontology, that's that's a simple task. It's not as if you're asking it to, you know, tell me about um, you know, so-and-so or give me your opinion on that. It, it's it's just say identify. And so this is, it's called fine tuning. Um, and um, that is something that you can you know, focus on very specific high quality literature and high quality text. But yeah, I, I think it's true that if, if a, as a general system, if you get more um, artificially generated hallucinatory uh, textual data, then yeah, it'll train off into wild directions. And yeah, it could probably get less accurate. All right, right here. Um, I am curious, some of the areas, so you, you basically use the principle, like a collected data and then do predictions, but how often do you need to update the data pools to kind of upgrade your AI predictions? Like, what is the deal with this? Like, I am trying to see. Thank yeah. you. I, I think, obviously, if you're dealing with a, a phenomenon that is changing over time, then you may want to have either more recent or um, more relevant data collected. Uh, some things don't change over time or don't change very significantly over time. Um, and um, so in the case of the weather data, uh, you know, it always rains, it always shines. Um, uh, so those are uh, things where you can go back you know, 60, 70, 80 years and use that as a, as a way of interpreting what will happen over the next month or six months or a year. Um, in the case of, say, cattle performance, um, the, there is genetic drift. There's selection for certain types of cows and certain types of performance. And so if you collect data about cattle from the 1940s, it's not relevant to today. So there is, and I guess part of it's just knowing your um, the body of work or the, the system you're studying to say, yeah, we should collect more recent data. Um, but in this case, we're mostly collecting things from you know the last 10 years. And so the, the genetic content of beef cattle in Alberta has not changed that much. And so we feel that we could predict these things pretty accurately going forward, at least for the next decade or so. Hey, thank you. That was great. Um, so in terms of the automation of database generation, which is a really neat concept, and I really talked a bit about that too. So I'm wondering about it in the con thinking in terms of agricultural production and on the agricultural side, as opposed to the omics side, maybe a little bit. I'm wondering how much, how much of that data, how much manual labor goes into the ontology definition. And so like that to me seems like the most manual part in terms of the value that you're gonna create from the database, the data extraction. So can that be automated? In principle, maybe. Um, I mean, we did the ontology manually and it took about five years. So, um, and part of it has to be in a, a way that is structured that makes sense to you as an expert in the area. Um, but of course we started this before uh, large language models really appeared. So I think it's possible um, to create an ontology. The other thing is that there's a lot of ontologies out there um, and um, our particular one, which is a chemical one, there just wasn't one, so we had to create it. But you know, I think there's some excellent ontologies in, in agriculture and, and livestock and, and crops. And so I think those could be used. Um, obviously, there's better ontologies now for food. Um, so I, I think those existing ontologies probably could be constructed or used as part of the same thing. And um, yes, then I think it's quite extensible and quite applicable. Uh, thank you, that's, that's, that's a great talk. 
Thank you. So I have a question about this one. I appreciate you mentioned about both animal health and animal productivity in cattle example. So you know, currently we have a high throughput uh, genome, genomics and omics sequence data. Uh, traditionally, we correlate uh, that genomics with uh, phenotype, you know, yes. by basically whole genome association analysis. Yeah. I wonder, do we have a current uh, pipeline for automated a uh, kind of AI dependent to genomic association analysis pipeline available for us or not? Yeah, I mean, that was the original intent when we started this. Uh, we had access to a lot of um, QTL data from um, certain groups uh, that would provide it with the cattle. And we had wanted to do that for this armchair rancher. Um, unfortunately, the, the data didn't come to us. Uh, <laughs> the um, um, I'm not quite sure what went wrong, but it probably had more to do with COVID than anything else. So, uh, but that was the intent. It still is the intent to be able to include that genomic data. But um, it was both surprising and even the, even the people who were doing the genomic data um, really felt that there were environmental variables that had as much or even greater impact on some of these features. And I think they were pleasantly surprised to see just how well we could correlate just from you know status, information about weather or information about um, the age of an animal or um, so um, so I think it, it's you know it's a combination of both, but the fact that we could include this environmental component and be quite accurate in some of these predictions was, both surprising, but it's that's a lot cheaper to get um, that kind of information than having to do a whole genome analysis. All right, thanks for the many questions. We'll do two more and then move on. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a specific question for the knowledge graph construction or knowledge-based construction. Um, for example, you said that the uh, large, language, large language models are good at NERs. Um, for example, if you if you see an epicatechin mentioned in a paper, and of course, GPT will be able to capture that as a chemical entity, but how do you plan to actually link it to the actual um, entry in, say, PubChem? Because there can be a lot of synonyms. So the question is, how would you do synonym resolution for, for example, chemicals or foods? Is there any specific plan for that? or? Uh... Yeah, that's partly the, the fine tuning and part of that is the labeling uh, process. So it's the fine tuning is somewhat manually intensive. And um, the person who's been doing this has spent about a month um, both doing the fine tuning and um, the, the modifications. So it's, um, you know, the ontology is one part, that was five years, the fine tuning is a month. Uh, so it's not all automated, um, but, you know, to be able to process 20 million documents, <laughs> it still is a big time saving. Um, uh, so I think it's worth it to do that, that manual fine tuning, but you, you do need the examples. And I mean, we have a lot of databases where the names and synonyms of compounds, the names and synonyms of foods, the names and synonyms of health effects, and then the ontology structures and the synonyms for those ontologies are all there. So that also has helped a lot with the fine tuning and training. So on a quick question still on that same topic, um, certainly the number of tokens you're feeding to the GPT is pretty high if you're feeding it full like journal articles. What's the cost of this process? Is it accessible to an academic lab or is it too much? So if you wanted to do it through GPT um, for all of PubMed and PubMed Central, I think it was $30 million. Um, so it's not accessible to anyone. Um, so uh, we're using Llama 2 uh, instead of ChatGPT. Um, and I guess there's, uh, I think it's the Falcon 570 is another one that's out there. So there's a couple of open source models that cost nothing except we had to get uh, a bunch of GPUs for about 20 or 30,000 bucks. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's it's not accessible using chat GPT, at least not with the cost model they have. So um, thank you, Dave, for the, the amazing talk. Um, last question from me. 
if you were to start your PhD now, right? We have a lot of PhDs that they are not just starting, right? First year, they don't know what to focus on. Where would you focus? Where do you see the low hanging fruits here? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, there's uh, the way I've always sort of approached science is uh, to try and identify that the things either from talking to people or my own experience, um, where the biggest problems are, you know, what frustrates you the most? <laughs> and so whether it's, you know, going to the store and knowing whether I'm getting a, a good uh, quality uh, wine or a good quality um, piece of fruit, or whether I'm eating a healthy diet, or if I'm working on the farm, you know, what the weather is gonna be, you know, two months from now. Each of those is sort of personal. Uh, everyone has a different need, but if those are things that are frustrating you uh, or frustrating your partner or your family, um, I think those are problems that I think machine learning and artificial intelligence can apply. And, and that start largely guided me in terms of where I uh, would do my research. It was, you know, coming back from a frustrating experience uh, shopping or coming back from a frustrating experience gardening or coming back from a frustrating experience and saying, you know, couldn't I do something that would make this a little faster, a little easier, a little better? Um, and I think this is, you know, the power that you have as a student, because you have these resources, things that were beyond our belief when we started out as students, but this is what's open to you. And I think this is pretty exciting to be at that, that inflection point in scientific history. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, David. So now uh, we will continue with uh, Abby Gilda Stevenson, who is the Chief Science Officer of uh, Mars. Um, she will uh, talk about the food system and how AI can help. Thank you, Abby. Hi everyone and thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to, um, to share a little bit with you about how um, AI is really helping transform um, food systems and and obviously work, working within Mars, I'm going to share a little bit about an industry perspective here. Um, just, um, you know, in terms of the challenges, the opportunities, the problems that we're trying to solve with AI. And uh, um, just like David said, really, I think we're very much at the beginning of, of this whole area that is, is you know, going, going to really help transform uh, food systems in the future. So I'm just going to share a little bit about how we see that uh, as part of the industry. So first of all, just a little bit about Mars. And for those of you who don't really know who Mars is, um, we are we're, we're um, a company is, that was established over 100 years ago um, in 1911 by the Mars family. And we are still owned by the Mars family, privately held family-owned company today. And the Mars family are really passionate about science and technology. They've been here at Davis many times. Davis is one of our strategic partners and we've been partnering with Davis for over 40 years now. So you see Davis is a really important part of our science and technology ecosystem. And um, Harold Schmitz at the back there knows this really well. Um, you know, he was really part of setting up the relationship between Mars and UC Davis. And, um, you know, today we are made up of three segments with the pet care segment and our snacking segment are our two leading segments. Um, the business was established on, you know, as a chocolate company and has diversified over the years uh, with the pet care ecosystem that is very sophisticated today, um, spanning from um, veterinary practices through pet food, through re reference laboratories. And that is an incredibly data rich ecosystem that is really helping fuel our innovation pipeline for pet care today. 
And then we have Mars Snacking and our um, smaller segment, the Food Nutrition Group as well. Um, so a very diverse organization underpinned by science and technology and research and development. So over 4,000 um, uh, associates within our business work on research and development and science and technology. We have an office downtown um, here and we work very closely with Davis, have our cacao germplasm collection on site um, here in, in greenhouses here, working on climate smart cacao for the future. So long, long history with Davis. So a little bit more about sci the science and technology that is done across Mars, um, just to give you a flavor for the diversity. So we work on many different areas of science and technology, helping address global challenges that are really critical to the future of our business and of food systems um, more, more globally everywhere. So we have five um, science and technology institutes and organizations within our group, um, really working on very diverse areas of science from the Pet Care Science Institute, which is located in the UK. That's where I joined Mars over 30 years ago. Um, and I've worked in three of these different institutes over my career on really diverse areas of science. So started on the Pet Care Science Institute, I've also worked at our Global Food Safety Center, which is located in China, and um, I've led our Mars Advanced Research Institute, which has a virtual hub based out here in Davis, um, but we are, locate, we are uh, connected into a global network of partners in science and technology, trying to really unlock those emerging discoveries that really fuel the future of innovation within Mars. And this is really where um, AI, data analytics, bioinformatics, um, machine learning, and deep learning are all becoming part of the way we do science at Mars, really fueled by the data that we generate within our um, factories, within our network, within our ecosystem, and also through accessing data from other sources, bringing together both publicly available data and, and our own data generated in-house as well, to look for those new solutions that um, can help fuel uh, the future. So if I look specifically at food, you probably have seen, if you work in the food industry, you work in research in food, then you've probably seen this before, that food security can only really exist when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. And that food must meet dietary, dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And we say, we, through the work we do at the Global Food Safety Center, we do say that if it's not safe, it's not food. Whatever else you do with food, it has to be safe. And that's why we, we actually invest a lot of, of uh, thought, time, into food safety and our approach to food safety, not only for us, but actually for the whole industry, because if anyone um, is affected by a food safety incident, it really affects the whole industry. And so it is in everyone's interest that we work on food safety and ensuring safe food is safe for all. Now, if you think about the data that's generated in the food, in the food industry, there is a lot of data. And we were talking about that earlier this morning. Data, in, to some extent, in the food industry is probably one of uh, the, the assets that is under leveraged today. And we are really, as a food industry, starting to recognize this and really working together on it. But compared to other industries like pharma and uh, you know, the, car, the car industry, perhaps, we're still early in that whole um, progress compared to some of these industries. Maybe, you know, David said earlier, 20 years behind the pharma industry in terms of understanding how to harness the data and leverage that in order to drive, you know, a, a change in the way that we operate in the food ecosystem, in, in the food industry. So what can we do with that data? What could that data, if we harnessed it in the right way, and we leveraged it, what could it do for the food, for, for the food systems? Food, we're all looking for food that is all these things. If we could harness the data, we could start to perhaps address some, address some of these things differently. So if we take 
food safety. In, in uh, 2022, the FDA recorded uh, 423 food safety incidents. And you can see by the bubbles here, the types of areas that food safety can, uh, issues are seen in. You've got allergens, uh, and it's still today, where we look at these on a regular basis, allergens still cause the number one challenge um, for recalls in, within the food industry. That can be mislabeling, that can be um, contamination with nuts in a nut free, in a product that was supposed to be nut free. It can be all of those types of things, but it's still the one of the most common food safety incidents. Microbial contamination, um, bacterial contamination there could be, could be anywhere in the food supply chain, foreign materials, um, you, you see a lot of issues that uh, result in a recall. So what can we do about that? So if we just look at microbial contamination, 99 recalls uh, caused by uh, microbial contamination in 2022. And if you break that down, you can start to look at um, exactly what the, the underlying cause was. Well, at least the bacterial cause. Then there is the root cause analysis to look at where that actually came from within the food supply chain. And this can often take days, weeks, often sometimes weeks. And in the meantime, the, the um, food producer has got that, that food on hold. It's not, it's not being sold. The factory might be stopped. Every day that that factory is stopped production costs that business money. And that starts to um, create issues. So this is where something like genomics, metagenomics comes in. And this is where data um, and analytics, bioinformatics, predictive capabilities can help to transform our approach to food safety. So increasingly, these techniques are being used today. Certainly regulators are fully leveraging whole genome sequencing. If they do an investigation in a food production facility, they are leveraging whole genome sequencing bioinformatics capability to explore that today. But what we know today is only about 5% of the industry are actually leveraging whole genome sequencing. And so we've been working a lot with whole genome sequencing. We've um, implemented it today within our own operations and we use it routinely. Um, and, and in support of that, we have created bio, bioinformatics platforms that enable us to do um, to take whole genome sequencing and look at whether we've seen this, this particular um, type of bacteria before, whether there's any history within our own supply chains, within our suppliers, but we're only in the 5%. And there's a lot more that can be done here. But once you start to generate these volumes of data, you then can, can start to move forward to prediction and how you can leverage artificial intelligence to bring together metadata, situational data, supplier information, alongside your whole genome sequencing data to start to look for those early, early sentinels, to, to look for changes, to do environmental monitoring, and start to do the, the um, predictive capabilities that will enable you to get ahead of incidents. We're not there yet, but we are certainly um, on the first step or even second step towards that. But this is an area with so much potential within the food industry. If we could just find, find mechanisms for uh, leveraging data, for sharing data beyond individual companies um, and working together across the industry and within that ecosystem around the industry to leverage the power of data to unlock the next generation of tools that can really help us to move forward to, to save food for all. So that's an example of food safety. Another one, another area that we work a lot in is aflatoxins. And um, it was what I found interesting was David's talk here because I think the climate and climate prediction is something that is coming to the fore when it comes to aflatoxins and mycotoxins in general. Um, because with climate change and with the um, much more um, unpredictable um, weather events, I, we're, we're concerned that aflatoxins and mycotoxins more generally are only going to become a bigger challenge to the food industry. 
And, and the more we can do to predict how weather patterns affect growing conditions for crops and some of these particular um, challenges for the food industry, the better prepared we're going to be. And the more we can start to look for solutions that help us um, tackle some of these grand challenges. So aflatoxins um, can be found in a variety of different crops. This was uh, data uh, taken from a few years ago, but you can see here that um, there are a number of different crops affected. Some of these are really important to, to us. Nuts for a Snickers bar, for example, and, uh, or, or M&Ms. Peanuts are really important to our business. Corn is really important to our business as well um, because corn gluten is a great, great source of protein for pet food. And corn gluten actually actually um, concentrates aflatoxin. So this is a big challenge for us. And so anything we can do to predict um, in, the, in both the short term um, at the farm level and longer term, the relationship between weather and uh, crop, the growth of crops and the um, likelihood of aflatoxin prediction, working together with farmers, we can start to do things like optimize our sampling plans around the risk assessment um, and the, long, the short and the longer term risk assessment. We can work together with farmers to try and mitigate um, right through the growing um, season if we know that there's going to be a high risk. Um, because food is wasted, as soon as you, as soon as you reject that, or the or the the crops uh, are um, you know the levels become too high, then the, then we're into food loss, and nobody wins when when food is um, wasted, then nobody wins. And in markets like uh, developing markets, the people who consume those contaminated um, grains are the farmers, and uh, when they can't sell it, they they consume it for their families. Um, so. The, this is a, a serious challenge that we at the Global Food Safety Center have been working on for a number of years, looking for solutions. And we have developed some, um, some early stage uh, tools that we're using in our own supply chains today. And we've shared a lot of that work as well through publications, through collaborations working in partnerships and consortia to share this information uh, because food safety information, food safety uh, challenges should never be a competitive advantage because everyone has the right to save food. So if we look at mycotoxins in particular, um, you can see the different stages in the manufacturing process where mycotoxins can become an issue. In the field, um, when you have opportunities to, to um, uh, embrace good, good agricultural practices and look at different ways to reduce the risk during the growing phase in the field. Here, climate obviously plays a really important role and that, that's why I was really interested in the work that you, you did there, David. Um, and then you have op options such as crop varieties, um, imp improved resistance to aflatoxins and treatments, so topical treatments or soil treatments. Um, at harvesting, the storage, the, the, the conditions under which the crop is um, harvested and the storage um, conditions under which it's stored then become incredibly important. Um, and, and storage itself. I know that there are today all sorts of sensors and devices that you can place within um, storage facilities to start collecting data on what happens during storage. But I think we're still at our infancy there in terms of understanding how to then mitigate and, and uh, what to do with a lot of this data. And then of course, during manufacturing, um, testing at the gate before you accept products. But we know in some markets like India, for example, if we reject corn, they'll take it around the corner and they'll take it to somebody else. So it doesn't necessarily get wasted, but that corn shouldn't necessarily be consumed. If we're not putting it in pet food, then it really shouldn't be going anywhere in the food chain. So we've been working on a aflatoxin risk prediction model, looking at how we can take different um, meteor uh, weather data um, to, and looking at how we can use that to predict the growth of, growth of aspergillus flavors and um, aflatoxin production rates. Um, and to look at then how that affects, how that's affected 
in transport and storage conditions as well. And we've created a number of different models here, a pre-harvest and a post-harvest model to come together with a risk prediction um, to, that, that enables us to have a look at our own farms. Uh, well, we don't own the farms, but the farms that we source from and work together with our suppliers to, to risk assess the aflatoxin levels um, in, the, in the corn that would then be coming to our factories. Then looking at what is possible here, we know that this is a map that is created um, for, for one of our own supply chains in Brazil. Looking here at um, a model that we created together with Cambridge University, looking at post-harvest, bringing together weather, weather and um, being able to predict the aflatoxin um, occurrence within one of our own supply chains. And today we are using this model, um, but one of the things I shared this morning is that we still need to understand fully how we can implement these models within our routine um, supply um, processes. And we have some way to go to work with the end users here to fully implement a model like this within our um, supply chain operations. So we have shown that it is possible to create predictive models that are able to help our supply um, associates with, with securing um, safer raw materials. But what we haven't done yet is fully implement this in, as routine within our um, supply network. And there is more to do here to fully optimize the end user experience. What about delicious? Well, flavor is an incredibly important part of uh, food as well. And we're still at the very, very early stages of understanding how to predict flavor, but it is a huge opportunity and one that um, we we still need to work on considerably to move us from more um, in vivo sensory um, and you know, smell and taste perception that is more human-based to really understanding how, how we can predict um, the flavor and the, the taste and the smell. And there have been um, you know, electronic noses and various other capabilities out there for, for some time, but they only go so far and they still don't fully reflect the complexity of the, the human or the cat or the dog in, in terms of being able to predict outcomes. But we think this is a huge area of opportunity for the future and one that um, should be brought together with nutrition and nutrition intake, um, nutrition delivery in order to optimize food systems in the future. So here we have how you might go about this. This is not something that we have done yet, but I'm just putting that out there as an opportunity in an area that I think has huge potential for the future in, in food systems. Flavor is incredibly complex and food, as we've heard a lot already, and as you guys know, because you're working in this space, food itself is, a, is very complex and the matrices involved in food production are often incredibly complex. And once you build in processing and packaging and, all, and shelf life and all those other things that we need to consider, it's an incredibly complex environment. And um, how to reduce data, how to optimize samples, how to conduct um, sensory tests, all, all of this is still to be solved. There is so much to do here, but um, it's, it's an area of huge opportunity for the future. And the health, of course, just to, to finish off here with an opportunity. Um, and many of you, I've seen some great work this morning, starting to really look at how we can link the food that we eat with the health outcomes that that food um, can deliver. And this is an incredibly complex area of both discovery and engineering and how you start to optimize um, food, de the design of food to um, drive healthier outcomes. It just, the, it is so multifactorial. And I think you guys out there are at the, uh, on the front, the leading edge of, of, how, um, of, of, of how we are actually together going to solve some of these problems and bring a whole new approach to, to food systems, health, sustainability, 
healthy people, healthy planet, all of those things that we all hear a lot of out there um, at the moment. There, there is so much to be done here. And I'm um, you know, bringing together techniques such as machine learning, multi-omics. We've heard, heard a bit about metabolomics today. I think we take that even further when you start to, to build in um, all of the, the different omics platforms that are starting to become available here, genomics through to um, metabolomics, proteomics, and um, environmental factors as well. So how we build that data ecosystem that enables us to move to predictive health outcomes. We are at the very, very beginning of that. And I very much agree with David's sentiment on that, sentiment on that, that you guys are at the beginning of a transformation in how science, technology, data, machine learning, um, and artificial intelligence are going to unlock a whole new level of understanding in this in this area going forward. So I think it is a very, very exciting time for the future of food systems. And um, I'm so looking forward to partnering with you to, to bring that to life. So with that, I think I have one more. I have one more here. So what's possible? I think, um, you know, it's, it's really how we bring all of these things together. So how, how we can bring nutrition and health through all of these aspects of data. Today, there are so many different ways to generate data. Um, personal devices, um, taking control of your own health. Um, I think the one thing that we do need to watch out for is that how do we make this affordable and accessible for all? We know today that in uh, the US in particular, um, the, the, the connections that, that we have here uh, through 5G to the devices and health monitoring is becoming um, available to many, but there are other countries around the world where this is still a significant challenge and the, the cost of entry is only going up at the moment. So how, do, how can we federate um, the access to healthy, healthy system, food systems for all going forward? I think it's a big challenge. So if we look at the future of artificial intelligence and food systems, AI is going to be at the center of, of the future for how we transform food systems, bringing together all of these different elements of data analytics with artificial intelligence leveraging that at the center is going to be the future. And you guys are at the cutting edge of that today. All of the programs that APHIS has are well aligned with the future. And uh, you know how together you guys integrate all of these and to create a new approach to food systems of the future. It's there for all of you to drive. Very impressive. And um, with that, Ilias, I'll, uh, I'll stop and just say, you know, the challenge is daunting, but with all of you, and the rest of your um, ecosystem, the people you're connected to and the networks that together we have, I think we're up for the challenge. Thank you. Video. Um, any questions? I'm Yes. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know quite what role AI will have there, but I think um, 
predicting uh, effects of processing, for example, on nutritional quality will be possible. I do think that there are many, many, many different factors that have perhaps driven down the nutritional quality in some places, um, you know, driving high yields over high nutritional value, for example, in some areas is a factor. So I think it, the, the way that we will address that across the industry is probably multifactorial, um, looking at plant breeding, looking at um, processing, um, looking at cooking practices, all of those things. Um, and I do, I do agree with you. I think it's a big challenge. And, and in some places we're, we're focused on supplementing to put back the nutrients that are removed, either have been removed over time as, as food industry has focused on just delivering food um, at, at scale. Um, I think it's a challenge for the whole industry. I, I think AI will have a role, but AI on its own will not solve the challenge. I think it needs to be multi a multi-dimensional approach. Yeah. I think vertical farming, you know, there, there's going to be many different ways to drive, start to focus on nutritional quality and not just quantity of food produced. Thanks, Abby. That was wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated, and I guess I didn't know enough about Mars, but its involvement with, with the pet care and, and pet food industry. And um, the um, I guess part of it is the potential that's there and what you're able to learn through animal studies and how it could be applied to people and humans. And I guess the question is, that data is incredibly valuable, but is it something that would ever see the light of day uh, in terms of, say, pet foods that um, extend the life of animals or extend the health of animals? Because they, dogs and cats are biologically very similar to humans, and there's a lot of um, components, obviously, in their diet that benefit us. And it seems yeah. that of, of all animals, probably dogs have the most similar diet or potentially the most similar diet to humans. Yeah. And I guess it's also struck me as this report of this dog in Portugal that um, turned 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. what did they feed it? <laughs> sort of yeah. Question. And that, I don't know, but that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, we, we um, have quite a focus on One Health, actually, the, the whole, the belief that um, animals, people, the environment, all need to come together if we're going to solve some of these big challenges facing um, facing society. Um, and we have done work um, looking at how dogs can be sentinels for human diseases, particularly zoonotic diseases that can be transferred between people and pets. So Lyme disease, for example, and this is published work where we showed that if early, early signs of Lyme disease in dogs can be indicators of a Lyme disease outbreak in humans. So the, there's a lot we can learn there from the the um, environment and, and what's going on. Well, I went to Nepal because we worked quite a bit with aflatoxins in Nepal. What they told me there was that when they get an aflatoxin outbreak, it's the wild dogs, the stray dogs that die first because they consume the contaminated grain left on the side of the road. And they, they are often sentinels of a, an aflatoxin contamination, a, an acute contamination. And Nepal is one of those countries where um, people die of aflatoxin contamination, kids die or, or stunting and, and it's quite severe. So the relationship between people and pets is very, is real and, and meaningful. And I do think you can draw insights from what is happening in pet data to understand how it affects humans too. Um, from from big data, and we we are actively looking at that, and we we probably are the guardians, if you like, or custodians of more veterinary data than anyone else in the world, and we have a responsibility to do things with that that are that help address some of these challenges. So yes, very much.
thanks so much for the talk. Um, I was curious about for your aflatoxin um, predictor model. It seemed like um, you were saying that there's lots of different things that can affect the production of aflatoxins, whether in the field or storage conditions. Yeah. Um, but the predictor model, was it based just on climate? It's or based weather? on climate and agricultural practices. Okay, so, so it included some of those other yeah, measurements Yeah, it does, also. because um, GAP and different elements of that have a big impact on the the likelihood of aflatoxins. What we it, it's a predictor for short term. What we haven't done yet, and what you really made me think of was how we can make it a longer term predictor as well. More of a future, more future proofing or giving us more time to intervene or put preventive measures in place. And I think that's the next step for the model rather than predicting short term sorting um outcomes to look at how we can actually get ahead of that um for growing cycles and intervene intervene earlier yeah thanks very much i i, I was curious given that you covered both animal and and human spaces it seems that improving flavor could be complex in different ways for animals yes. and for humans and i wondered if you could give some thoughts on that entirely true and even more so for cats um, than dogs, really. Cats are obligate carnivores and really quite different. Although the high level, they're similar. Actually, there are lots of, um, the cat has lots of un pretty unique adaptations for a high protein diet. It doesn't have, the cat doesn't have a sweet taste receptor that's active. They have no um, salivary amylase in, amylase in the mouth. So they, the carbohydrate digestion doesn't start there because they're they're designed to, to be upregulated for high protein. The uma umami taste sense is really strong in the cat. So they are pretty different. I think dogs are probably a little bit more similar to people and they're also scavengers. So they're more likely to just eat what, what you offer them. But cats are pretty highly tuned. Yes, and very. we've done a lot of work. We, we actually very recently just wrote an article in Science about um, cats because they're pretty special. From a research point of view, they are fascinating because they're just so different. Yeah, everything you expect a cat to do, it, it's you think wow. you, when you find out, it's the complete opposite from what you might expect. Yeah, yeah, they're fascinating. Yeah, dogs are a bit more like people. Yeah. Thank you, Abby, for the inspiring talk. Um, so Mars has been a pioneer in uh, adapting and adopting AI uh, yes. in, in both in uh, food science and confectionery as well as pet care. Um, renal yeah. tech, as we discussed before, as you mentioned, that today is one by them. Um, like looking, like looking to your crystal ball uh, for the next three years, let's say, um, where do you see AI uh, making uh, a difference? and uh, being adopted by the industry? I think, and we talked a little bit about this this morning, I think um, while, while some groups will progress this through use cases that are pretty um, comprehensive, I think the, the bulk of the applications in the next two to three years will be in things that make a difference to the way people do, do their work today. So they either drive efficiency or they enable them to do their job to a higher level. So with practical application today. So for example, together with uh, Pippa, we're working on a, um, kind of a predictive horizon intelligence tool. This, the, the practical application of that, that I think people in our organization will, will think is the best application are things that enable them to do literature searches very easily, c condensing huge volumes of um, information, whether that's literature or data, or perhaps bringing those together to, um, to in a way that the human brain can't operate with the volume of data available today. So how do we help people do their jobs more effectively, quicker, or to a high higher level of, of uh, quality, so that they um, engage and adopt these tools and really start to become um, AI literate 
I think. Um, and and that for many people is still a bit of a black box. It's still a bit scary. You guys are on the front edge of adoption and you I'm sure are far more comfortable with these tools. If you've been in an industry um, operational role for 20 years, these kind of tools are not easy to adopt. And we need to make it as simple and as as um, embedded in their everyday work as possible. So, and, and once we get the proof points and the use cases, I think adoption will move, but people just need to see the benefit in the here and now. And so taking people, you know, meeting people where they are today in their, in their jobs and making it as simple and easy for them to engage in tools that enable them to see the benefit quickly within their roles, it's going to be essential. Yeah. But on the front edge, we can work on these other more complex um, you know, and um, transformational models too. We can't wait for the rest to catch up, but we need to be doing a, a multi-pronged approach that gives people things they can see in the here and now while also creating that capability that is going to transform the future. And um, having those few people on the edge who are working in that space to, to ensure that by the time everybody else catches up, we're ready. Yeah. Wesley. Oh, you want to talk? Um, so across the portfolio of, of things that you've described, Abby, I mean, you're looking across a very broad spectrum of things, which I think is exciting. And it's exciting to see how Mars is kind of moving in these different areas. If you were to kind of say, the think about like the top three or four challenges or opportunities that you have to implementing AI in these different ways. How would you describe those to kind of this this room and what what can people be doing to solve those challenges that that Mars needs solved to see the the kind of engagement or embrace of AI in the in the way that you've described? I think one that we're working on already is how we consolidate huge volumes of data, um, whether that is um, publications or publicly available data and proprietary data and look and look at that in new ways. So enable people to unlock new opportunities very simply through bringing together things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do manually. So that's one area. Um, I think, um, the, the other thing that the other big challenge that we have in industry is that our data ecosystems are not set up to leverage AI. We have huge amounts of data, but it is not, it's not, um, you know, cat, it's not well cataloged. It's not curated in ways that um, lend themselves easily to AI. You know, we, for a global organization, we're, we're working through a process to, to really bring, you know, create the right architecture within our organization to, to set data up, but we have a long way to go still. Um, you know, the, the recently it, with the, uh, um, one of the recent food safety conferences, there was a survey done, which even asked people if they record their data electronically. And more than half of the organizations who responded still record data on paper. So as an industry, that is one of our biggest challenges. We have to digitalize our, organ our data ecosystems and then curate them in ways that lends itself to these new tools. So that is also a massive challenge. So AI has huge potential, but we have to, the end user and the data ecosystem that will enable this to be fully leveraged within industry is still a long way from being ready. So I think, I think use cases in meaningful areas that can demonstrate the benefit will help move all this along. Um, but the wholesale, um, that AI being the standard way way to and and data being fully digitalized is still a long way to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One more. One more. <laughs> One more. <laughs> 
uh, thanks for presenting. It's very inspirational. I'm just want to ask on behalf of, on behalf of students, what what's Mars plan about like workforce recruitment who specialize in artificial intelligence and agricultural? Oh, that, that, is, that is a good question. Um, that we have an office downtown in Davis that's working on cocoa science. Um, so we work very closely with the agriculture department here on cocoa science. Um, but uh, and and roles are advertised on Mars.com for any any roles that we're looking for. But we we have a lot of scientists within our business working on very diverse uh, ranges of projects. Um, and I'd be more than happy to to share with you. We have a number of hubs where our scientists tend to be recruited um, around around the world, really. So our um, for our snacking organization, our um, innovation center is in Chicago. Um, for our pet care in North America, it is in Nashville. And then we have our cocoa science here um, center here. So we have a number of hubs within the US where we're regularly recruiting for scientists. Um, in the UK, we have our Waltham Pet, Pet Science Institute. In China, we have our Global Food Safety Center and we have significant R&D recruitments for product developers as well in a number of places. So yes, Mars.com, have a look at vacancies there. All right, let's thank Abby and David one more time. Thank you. All right, after this, we proceed to some uh, reception and snacks out back. And I want to let uh, our 1890 guests know that we'll be uh, picking you up for your evening event uh, from the front of this area here at 530 and then at 540 uh, in the front of Hyatt Place over there. So we'll uh, take care of you this evening. All right, see you outside. Feel free to take a look at the robot. Was it down? Yeah. <laughs>